that, that was the first thing on the agenda, actually. Um, presentation thingy is not yet. Could you just go back one slide? Yeah, here we go. Um, actually, it's covering the, the same thing as the 2015-3 uh, proposal, which with very large organizations having issues with, well, addressing routing things. So giving us more background to actually make educated decisions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Gert, and uh, thanks to the chairs for inviting me for this one. Uh, my name is Anurai. I'm I have a technical background in, in provider operations in the 90s. I'm on the other side of uh, things to some degree in the interim, which means I'm mostly involved in security and network security stuff in large organizations. And uh, my goal today is to, to give a bit of like a perspective what, um, what I see, what kind of discussions I see in that type of organizations and how those might influence their um, decisions when it comes to uh, becoming RIR members or right members or um, applying for an allocation and all these things. Uh, actually, I'm going to cover three main topics. That is what I call and what is generally called uh, out of region announcements. Those out of region announcements and their role might have an influence on the decision of certain types of organizations um, as for their uh, RIR memberships and um, I have some slides but those slides are not relevant for the majority of you so I will skip them on what are these specifics or pitfalls when it comes to uh, applying um, for membership at certain RIRs. We should keep in mind that I think there is two main categories of LIRs in uh, uh, RIPE space in the interim. That is, say, the traditional ISP LIRs. And then in the last years, a, a, a new group has emerged uh, that I call the enterprise LIRs. And uh, funnily, I, I was uh, actually, um, when Alexander uh, gave the presentation on, on that proposal, uh, I was a bit of uh, like smiling as uh, I know all these types of discussions and um, just keep in mind let's say these two groups and uh, I'm like uh, today the representative of, uh, of the second group of the enterprise LARs. Uh, I don't really judge on things, uh, I just want to provide uh, insight how they, how they feel and um, uh, how they uh, act on this. Yeah, okay, um, thanks for that. Um, what we see, and the organizations where, where I'm involved in IPv6 uh, planning and deployment uh, efforts, is uh, pretty much all of them, all large organizations uh, that I know, in, in, in mainly in Germany where I work, uh, have become a RIPE member in the last years, uh, just to avoid all the hassle involved with um, applying for a PI assignment. You know, through the sponsor link, really, uh, there is uh, a lot of paperwork involved. Um, uh, there might be discussions if this is uh, like um, legitimate as a kind of end user organization, or as it was called in the earlier days, uh, to become an LIR. But let's just face the fact uh, they have all done this. Uh, none of them was interested in, in like uh, going through the uh, PI uh, efforts and hassle and uh, actually the cost might even be higher than becoming a LAR. Uh, so um, let's take this as a given that they do so and there is a huge number of them. And uh, to be honest, I don't have the impression that the RIRs are particularly unhappy with this. As if, I mean, it's new members um, and uh, these new members bring in new money and importance and weight and whatever. Uh, so while usually address policy working group I think is mostly about prescriptive, like policy matters, what I'm going to do uh, right now is uh, to give like descriptive, um, descriptive impression what, what's happening out there. So uh, let's have a look at what are out of region, or what is out of region use, or what are out of region announcements. Um, uh, to define them, it's, it's pretty simple. 
look at this picture and then uh, think about it uh, once uh, address space and a location is requested in the jurisdiction of one arrow error and that space is actually used where used means not uh, like use it internally but uh, propagated routing wise in the jurisdiction of another arrow error this is called uh, or this is what i call and other people call out of reach and use and there are two main reasons for this uh, when it comes to ipv4 space uh, a major reason or uh, might be there is a uh, policies or there is uh, like initiatives trying to uh, prevent this but uh, a reason might be an organization which can't get address space in their own jurisdiction uh, just shows up at another area and gets space there which then in the end of the day is going to be used in another part of the world uh, when it comes to IPv6 there is mainly technical requirements uh, think about uh, such an organization that um, uh, Alexander laid out uh, retail organization, they have like, as you said, 10k uh, sites. Somewhere in those sites are not necessarily connected by one consistent backbone network, but uh, many of those sites might have their own uh, internet uh, uplinks in country and region. And now if they want to use a consistent addressing um, scheme within their organization with global addresses, as opposed to uh, like RFC 1918 addresses in, in IPv4, H, uh, and they, want to, they don't want to, uh, to use NAT, uh, it means announce like, um, Ilyich will be scared about this, uh, announce a, a high number of uh, specifics, uh, more specifics in some part of the world uh, where the subsidiaries actually sit. Uh, so there is, an, and I can tell you many of the organizations they think about uh, doing exactly this. Uh, what can go wrong? I mean, from an RIR's perspective? If, if, if you say high number, are you talking about one per country, one per city, one per office? I'll one per office would definitely scare people. One per country, one per region is uh, actually not no, so it's, bad. It's probably one per site, one per plant. So if it's 10K sites, it's 10K announcements. Um, I, I would say, I mean, the, the, the sample that Alexander gave, that uh, 10K is a huge number, but uh, say a typical organization like in manufacturing, automotive or so, they have several hundred sites world, uh, worldwide, and this is what they, uh, what they usually solve, uh, or what they, what they think about this, what they call uh, local internet breakouts. Uh, so I, I would say in, a, in a several hundreds, that's what uh, the space where I work would, which would be seen. So what could, could go wrong with those out of region announcements from an ROIS perspective, address space uh, poaching, like uh, people from one region showing up in another region, uh, they can't get space in their own and apply at another uh, ROIR. From ISP's perspective, obviously the stuff um, uh, that uh, like Ilyich uh, mentioned in the sense of uh, many, many uh, more specific platinum routing tables, which is essential, which is even more bad maybe if this, if it's not just within uh, a region, but uh, these are outer region, like uh, more specifics from uh, um, uh, like uh, some part of the world, Korea, Uruguay, or wherever, uh, cluttering routing tables uh, in, in Munich at Spacenet, uh, just uh, to give an example. And from an uh, enterprise perspective, uh, they are like, oh, wait a second, there is this clause, uh, routability not guaranteed. Uh, will it work at all? If we, if we strive for such an approach, be it good or bad from, from your perspective here in the room, uh, will, will it work technically? Uh, especially keeping in mind, um, uh, some of you might, might know that at the, uh, in, in London at RIPE69, at, in the routing working group, I gave a, a presentation with actual uh, research data we had from the routing information service on um, the filtering of uh, slash 48, more specifics from um, LIR space. And uh, actually it happens, it's not much, but still it happens, so it gives uh, this bad feeling to the enterprise organizations. Well, if there are ISPs out there doing this, what I personally think is not a good idea, but um, this is just me, silly thing of uh, prefix filter, strict prefix filtering, uh, this might even uh, be worse, uh, strict prefix filtering, um, if we announce a part of our RIPE address space in Uruguay, Korea, wherever. 
Uh, so the, the, the question is actually, will it be routed? Uh, this is what, what drives the discussions in many, many enterprise LARs right now. Uh, if we do this, can we, can we use uh, address space in other parts of the world? Which then again, uh, I mean the question uh, or the answer is, well, who knows? It depends. Uh, as, um, there, are two, might, there might be two sources uh, for a response to this question. Will it be routed? That could be what's guidance from RIR's uh, perspective? Is there any policies on this? And what is the actual reality happening out there? And when it comes to the RIR's um, uh, like positions, policies, uh, just to give you a quick overview, Erin, uh, they had a policy proposal which was just recently abandoned by the Advisory Council. Uh, to the best of my knowledge in RIBE NCC, there are some statements here and there, but there is no um, really like official position on out of region use. Um, I, I will give a quote from Andrea in a second. Uh, APNIC and LACNIC, to the, I, I couldn't identify anything, and AFRINIC, uh, they have a, a policy proposal which is uh, very much oriented um, uh, towards the one from Aaron. Aaron, in Aaron's proposal, which was again, it was abundant um, three weeks ago, uh, the, the, the intent was like, okay, um, if an organization wants to do this, uh, they still have to prove that a certain part of the uh, allocation they um, uh, applied for uh, is, is used within region. Uh, when it comes to RIBE NCC, um, Andrea gave a statement uh, in the, during the discussion in the Aaron uh, policy mailing list, uh, which um, I highlighted the main part in, in, in red, which is, uh, well, we don't really care, like, or we don't really prescribe our policies on this. Uh, it's just we expect a member organization to have at least one active network element within region. So there is not much from that angle, uh, like which could answer the question, will this work or not? Um, when it comes to actual reality, uh, I, I discussed it with some of my old buddies in ISP space. They said, we don't see this very, very much. We can't really, I mean, it's difficult to say where it, uh, uh, from an AS number, where it actually uh, originated. You could um, dive into this, but we don't see very much of this. Uh, there is, um, in, in some discussions, there's always like, oh, Cisco does it. Um, but uh, again, um, looking at routing tables, uh, you, you don't really know where they announce uh, the space and uh, how many uh, of that is actually announced out of region. Uh, so from that angle, one can't really answer the question of the enterprise uh, organizations, will this work? Um, to quickly summarize this, uh, there might be organizations who want to go this path for whatever reason. It's not really clear if this is, will work from a uh, governance or from a technical level, which then means that uh, most organizations, again, that I'm involved in, they, uh, they follow the path of applying for RIR membership at several RIRs. Um, I, I, I can give you at least uh, five names of the like 30 German largest organizations which, have, uh, um, which are in the interim RIPE members. Um, uh, APNIC members and Aaron members, and at all of those, uh, they have, uh, again, um, this will scare some people here in the room, and uh, it might rightfully do so, scare them. Uh, they applied for the routing space, and they, they plan to use it in, in some way in the future, um, which is not really clear right now. Uh, so it's actually, um, this has, thinking about this and not having a definite answer uh, leads to certain um, consequences as for the actual actions of organizations out there. Uh, I have um, put together some slides what are the specifics when it comes to applying those. I will mostly skip them as they are not uh, relevant for most of you here in the room right now. Uh, just um, one thing, uh, given I've been involved in many of these procedures and in, in, in pretty much all of them. I haven't done Afrinic. I've done all the other several times. Uh, the, the crucial point is about payment. Getting the fees paid by corporate purchasing, that is the actual difficult part. But uh, again, I, I, will, I will skip all this and uh, jump right to my uh, uh, last slide here. Uh, which actually, I mean, the conclusion is uh, we, we, I expect 
to see a growing number of out-of-region announcements for whatever reason. It might be in IPv4 space, there might be certain reasons in IPv6 space, there might, uh, might be certain reasons like the ones that uh, Alexander and Taha laid out. Uh, the question, I, I would like to ask a question instead of giving like a definite conclusion on this. Um, uh, do people here in the room, do you, do you, do we as a community expect this to be a problem in the future? And if so, um, how would we tackle this? Uh, and uh, well, um, we might even ask uh, if address, address policy is the right um, place to tackle this or if, if this should be discussed in the routing working group. Uh, these are the questions I would like to, uh, to discuss. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank, thanks for bringing um, your background from, from a different, different user community, basically. Um, of, of course, the easy way out for this community is just to point at the routing working group and say, oh, it's their issue to solve. But it, it tackles, as we have seen in the policy proposal from, from Andrew, uh, from Matthew and Alexander, that it's actually touching on address policy. So um, it's good to have background information to make educated decisions. Welcome. I, I haven't seen who was first. Eric is always first. <laughs> Eric Weiss. Um, so what I found interesting in the, the whole presentation that you gave is that the networks of those companies, and specifically to their locations, they are not interlinked. So basically they're uh, assigning a portion of the uh, acquired allocated space and assigning it to a location and just announce it there as if it was PI space. So basically my question at that point is, why not use the space from the ISP that you have at that location and basically request them to basically provide you with the IP space that you have. In that case, the ISP locally can actually do the, uh, the aggregation and if it's basically because somebody is too lazy to do their own firewall policy because this is very easy to just do, you know, a slash 28 in a firewall uh, to actually do the whole management. I think he has different issues because that will that won't work. Uh, so if it, if the networks and the locations are not interlinked. Why go this route? Because I'll filter the slash 20, uh, the slash 48s, or uh, smaller, whatever you try to announce, uh, for any prefix, which basically comes from a 32 or larger. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'd like to just uh, to answer this in, in several steps. Um, uh, first of all, uh, usually the networks are interlinked. They have like a global. Um, uh, those organizations have like a global MPLS backbone um, or MPLS network, not a backbone. But uh, for like uh, saving bandwidth, saving costs, whatever, uh, they still, I mean this local internet breakout thing, there was organizations which call this PI, uh, a public internet <coughs> offloading. So it's not, um, they, they are actually not fully independent, those uh, sites, but still um, there's uh, like reasons where they decide to go with, um, uh, have, a, have a local proxy and to just uh, put all the HTTP and HTTPS traffic uh, from, the, from the local link. Whereas uh, there is still this um, uh, global interconnection. Um, what I, that, uh, so from a technical perspective, they have this. On the other hand, um, uh, please consider, I'm, I'm just um, liking speaking as a representative, observing certain trends. Uh, I can assure you that uh, those um, uh, like uh, Taha did, um, these are very large organizations with network teams who mostly know what they are doing. Um, 
so I, I would be cautious, like uh, qualifying, okay, these guys have no clue what they do and uh, they shouldn't do it this way. Um, I'm, I'm just observing a certain trend. And as for the, the last one that you mentioned, um, filtering every uh, s uh, slash 48, um, or slash uh, filtering 48s which come from an allocated slash 32 um, space, uh, this brings us to the uh, very fierce uh, debate of strict filtering. Um, what it's, uh, it's not a debate, it's actually best practice. It's not. Um, we can... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll disagree on that. <laughs> yeah, we, we will. Um, uh, I mean, I gave a presentation at, uh, in the, in the, at RIPE 69 on actual f with uh, research data, how many organizations uh, still um, uh, filter uh, on uh, slash 48. Um, and we looked at data from five IXs in, uh, throughout Europe. I can tell you, I, I did, I, we, we collect this data once a quarter. Uh, on 1st of January, 2015, this year, uh, there was, when it comes to slash 48, um, announced, the, for the first time, the number of slash 48 announced without a covering aggregate was bigger than the number of slash 48 with a covering aggregate, all from a PA space. I'm not talking about PI. I'm not talking about 2006, yeah. uh, 2001, yeah. six, uh, six, seven, eight. Uh, so there is a growing trend towards um, uh, not doing strict filtering out there. And uh, as uh, Randy Bush would call it, it's the market who decides. It's customers paying for, uh, for, for uh, providers transporting their traffic. So I think uh, strict filtering will go away, but we uh, agree to disagree on this. So. Um, uh, just, just let, let, let me just uh, in, in inject something that you explained to me, but didn't explain to the group. Very, very easy example. Like you have this uh, global multinational company that has their own backbone, and they have Europe and the US. They want to, to offload the traffic to their peers in the well, in, in the region where they are. So they have a big internet pipe in the US, a big internet pipe in Europe. But these are not ISPs, so they don't... Uh, for an ISP, it doesn't matter where the packet is coming back. For an enterprise, there's a stateful firewall. So you have to ensure the packet is coming back where you send it out. So uh, given the internet is what it is, the only way to enforce packets you send out to the, uh, at the US link to actually come back at the US is to have a more specific being announced in the US and a more specific announced in Europe. So if, if they insist on having multiple interconnection points and having stateful firewalls, some trade-off has to be made. Just explaining a bit more background that hasn't... That's technology as we have it today. I'm just explaining why, why this is coming up. Okay, you, you might explain to us how, how to do it. I, I can only say that, as I said, um, the number of more specifics without covering Evergrad January this year for the first time exceeded uh, the other value. This is like research data. S sorry, uh, Ilyas from again. A quick point uh, regarding the asymmetric routing and the firewalls. If you put one firewall in Europe, one in the US, and you expect all the traffic uh, that you receive in, the, in Europe to go through the firewall first and then transatlantic, then you have made an insane network design, and we as RIPE shouldn't consider those people. That, that, you shouldn't that, do that, it That's do not it what like he said. It's, it's the other way around. I have a 29, I use a 32 of that for my American network, a 32 for the European network. I expect traffic I send from the American network to the American internet to really come back in America and not have the response packets come in in Europe because somebody else's routing policy says Europe is much better. The yeah, but, well, it, do we want to use, have people to use IPv6 or do we want to have them use NAT? With NAT you can get around all this easily. There's a trade-off to be made. Routing table slot versus NAT in many cases. I'm not saying what is right. I'm saying that there is no perfect solution today. And David has been standing there patiently for too long. Sorry. Hi, uh, David Huberman from Microsoft. Eno, this is very good, thank you. Uh, my experience is 
completely mirror what you have said. Um, so you ask, do you consider this a problem? The only thing I found in your presentation that's a problem is that organizations feel the need to go to multiple RIRs for their IPv6 need. As an operator who operates in all five RIRs, one of the things I respect and like most about the way the RIPE addressing policy working group has developed over the years is a sort of liberalness that says, let's just give the numbers where they're needed with as little crap as possible. And I would love the, for this working group to say very strongly to the world and to the NCC that if you are based in Europe and you need IPv6, you come to us and you can use it wherever your network takes you. That's very important. Thank you. I, I thought we'd do that. Um. Yes, Milton Mueller, <clears throat> Aaron Advisory Council and uh, Syracuse University for a few more months anyway. Um, I was very pleased with your presentation because uh, we did indeed go through a very intense debate about the out-of-region use policy. I was a shepherd for that policy. And we went through several iterations of it. And uh, in effect, we didn't really abandon it. Uh, be, I mean, we did abandon that specific policy. But there was a, a significant amount of support for the idea of the policy. But we discovered that we were bumping into high-level principal disagreements about what RIRs should be doing. And that those issues uh, maybe should be discussed in a broader context. So what you did was set the stage for something I wanted to do here anyway, which is raise the issue of whether the number space is in fact global and RIRs are facilitators uh, because of linguistic differences and geographic distance. Are they facilitators of the distribution of these addresses? Or do we conceive of RIRs as territorially exclusive distributors of resources and you have to go to each one of them, and the usage is supposed to be somehow conformant to the so-called jurisdiction of these RIRs. Um, and I, you know, we're not going to resolve that issue, but one of the issues that you didn't mention that came up in our discussion was uh, so-called ICP-1, which is an ICANN statement of policy about criteria for the establishment of new RIRs. We were told uh, by some of our staff members, incorrectly I believe, but we were told this very vehemently that uh, the out of region use policy conflicted with ICP-1. Uh, in other words, because ICP-1 says a few words about if you create a new RIR, it shouldn't overlap with an existing one, that we're moving towards a model of territorially exclusive RIRs. Uh, but if you read uh, you know, what ICP-1 actually says, it was really created to facilitate uh, AFRINIC and uh, establish some general criteria for when you would want to establish new RIRs. So I think uh, the community has to have a broader discussion about the reason for the regionalness of RIRs and uh, whether the number space is global, whether we want to facilitate global use of addresses or not. Uh, and I hope that you've helped to you know, stimulate this discussion. Yeah, I'm okay. So, um, I, th I think uh, 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 one thing is very, very simple. Complete territorial exclusiveness cannot exist because networks do not stop at borders. So it can never be absolute. Well, one of the impetus for, for the, one of the failed policy efforts in this area came from law enforcement agencies in the U.S. that would very much like for addresses to be territorial and to map to jurisdictions. And, um, you know, if you're going to do that, uh, as one put person in our debate said, uh, why not just have NIRs um, instead of RIRs? So, that's another consideration. Jen Lenko, just a network engineer who operates uh, worldwide backbone. I could not get my head around the idea of original use of IP address. Internet is global. My backbone is global. I can't understand how can I limit the usage of address space to a particular geographic region. Yes, it said networks do not stop at borders, right? 
and internet work like that way, that the only way for a network to do traffic engineering can ensure that I receive traffic through the link I want is to advertise more specific sometimes. I know that it might be evil. In some cases, here yeah, you uh, de-aggregate, but sometimes it's the only way you can do if you want to be multi home and use your own address space. So I, I think as soon as we apply some common sense, I think that's okay. That's not a problem, right? A big problem, at least. We do see this in V4, and we think it's even worse because people don't want to use NAT, so you cannot do this crazy policy-based routing with using nothing, your network to a different address space, right? You want to use your v 6 address space and advertise it in many locations. So I cannot see why it's a problem when we're even talking about out-of-region use. Internet is one big thing. Thank you. Um, three more quick comments, please, because uh, we have two more agenda items, and otherwise it will all be your lunch break. Hello, my name is Thomas Schmidt. I'm from Continental, the automotive supplier, and we are exactly such a global acting enterprise, and I'm there in RN, EPIC, and RIPE, and exactly for the same reasons Enno pointed out. And of course, we have an internal MPLS backbone and acting as an ISP internally, but we have also all kind of independent internet access. Sometimes because it's, it's faster to gain access via the internet than become uh, uh, owner of a leased line. And, and we have also some failover requirements that, that we have sometimes output in the States and the income again in, in Europe or, or EPIC. So uh, I, I fully agree that the community should uh, face these questions and uh, focus a little bit more on enterprises which not acting as a normal ISP carrier. But actually, it's, it's uh, well, the onus is not just on us, so the onus is on you as well to teach us on wh what you do and uh, what you need. So this is very good to have, I know here it's good to have you here to actually speak up and, and yep, state, state your issues. Um, we tend to use at things, look at things through an uh, ISP perspective because, well, at least me, that's what I've been doing for 20 years. So I don't know all the other sides. It's good to have you bring it up. Please, please keep doing so. Hans-Peter. Hans-Peter Wohlen, uh, speaking as former Address Policy Working Group Chair. Uh, we, I seem to remember we had this discussion sometimes in the 90s. It wasn't V6 then, but it was kind of the same discussion. And uh, the consensus here then, which was not shared with our colleagues from the other side of the Atlantic, was that IP addresses, you get them from RIPE and you can pretty much use them in your network, wherever that is. So if you build a global network, you're more than happy to come here and get your addresses for that network. Now, on the networking plan, well, it's many years since I did hands-on networking or planning, but this seems to be exactly the same things that I was dealing with back then. A large corporation makes a huge, nice, uh, pretty internal addressing plan and then figure out that, oh, we should have made this according to our network topology, not according to our org chart. Because they end up with uh, having three or four islands which are not connected internally anyway and then you need to redo your plan. And I mean, I've, I've done this too many times that my, my grand plan of the universe lasted half a year. So, so I don't think there is any one size fits all, uh, and there is a lot of experience here from past mistakes. So maybe, maybe, maybe some of that could be taken into account here. Thank Thanks. you. Lu, Lu Heng, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Lu Heng from Outside Heaven, and uh, uh, my comment is really small MNEs. Uh, we're not a large op corporation at all. We have about 70 people. But we, in past few years, I do face this problem outraging for, with IPv4. Uh, so basically, it's heavy debate in almost every continent about uh, if it's right to use the IP address out of the region. And uh, as Mueller said, there's two, two wave opinions. Uh, my parents would support it when you know, it's one global IP, one global network, so we shouldn't have a problem of using IP address anywhere, really. But because in, in a specific consequence of V4, uh, 
number one is there's a trading value nowadays. Number two, there is different exhaustion in having one continent, the other continent. So uh, I believe at this point of time, we have, uh, we have opportunity to make things right at this time to make V6 truly global. So because it's infinite, number two, there is no trading value in V6, at least at the foreseeable future. So I think we can, at, this, at least at this time, for V6, we lo allow people to use it everywhere, anywhere as you want it, as long as there's a network need. And uh, that will, you know, uh, to get rid of the hassle we had with out of region use with V4 for the past many years. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Th thank you. Sorry for cutting the discussion a bit short, uh, but we are cutting into Eric's time, actually. So, um, yeah, give an applause to Enio for actually <laughs> starting the discussion. Um, thank you. And, yeah, please keep bringing, bringing back issues that affect you because you feel underrepresented, whatever.